Data miner Gago stared at the results of the analysis, still in disbelief that this wild theory had borne fruit and stood up to scrutiny again and again. But now, here before him in data as clear as even the youngest apprentice could see, was evidence, clear and unshakable. Humans were not what they promised themselves to be. Feeling slightly nauseous with anxiety, he keyed in a request to meet with the diplomat's office as soon as possible. As the diplomat looked over his latest treaty proposal, there was a faint sound of horns in harmonious blaring, signifying someone had requested permission to enter. Glad for any distraction from the monotonous paperwork, he activated the intercom, saying, You are recognized and accepted. Please enter. As the crouched and scrabbling shape stepped into the doorway, diplomat Hale he mused again how interesting it would be if, the, if their ancestors could have heard such a magnificent call for a mere diplomat, Previously, such a grand instrumentation would have been reserved for a high chieftain or king, and yet here was Hale He, a diplomat to be sure, but certainly no ruler of any stripe, heralded by a song that would bring envy even to high lords and minor rulers in ages past. The individual sat before him, and Hale He could tell by their coloration and the shape of their antenna they were a scientist or engineer, someone likely far more familiar with numbers than he was. Hale He, while now taking on the rich purple hues of a diplomat, had the underlying colour of brilliant crimson, a mark of his near decade of study as a historical scholar and graduate before his appointment into diplomacy. What do you have for me? Gago, I believe. The other individual nodded, crossing his pinches in a sign of deference and respect. I am sorry to disturb your appointment, but I have important information regarding humans. Ah, yes, humans, said Hal He feeling a degree of relaxation and comfort at the mention of the gregarious and affable people. Humans had taken quite some time in venturing out to the stars, but their planet was located such that a number of major trade routes passed quite near to their system. Several species had reported contact with them before humans had in turn reached out and started to make contact of their own. But from all reports, they were kind, clever and selfless to a fault, with no recent instances of conflict despite a very violent early history. They were renowned for having an impeccable record of interspecies relations. I am actually in the process of framing a new trade treaty with some of their inner system human colonies. I believe the primary planet in question is called Mars, but they also have gas refineries and extractors above their gas giants and several mining operations set up on a number of moons in their asteroid belt. Yes, I have seen the newscast about how much this treaty is expected to aid both species, said Gago. There was an odd note of apprehension Hale he could detect in their chittering voice. There is some invaluable context that I believe needs to be put to light. Context? What do you mean, context? Well, you are aware that we, the Civicor, first met humanity when a trade ship fell off course and crashed upon Earth. It is a well-known accident, some manner of navigational mishap, Thankfully, our propulsion systems are far more accurate today. This is true, but are you also aware the Bayons have a remarkably similar story related to their first contact with humanity as well? A military scout vessel intending to regroup with the bulk of their fleet and engaging the Dendite menace, and they were likewise drawn off course, spiralling to crash onto Earth as well. I remember the stories that Time hypothesized that it was Dendite sabotage, even though it was unlikely for such a minor and inconsequential vessel, said Hale He. Other than that, I'm unfortunately not familiar with their own reports on it. But our two species are but a few, from over a dozen first contact reports with humanity, all stemming from engine failures, navigation failures, and crashes, or forced landings of ships that lost control and arrived on Earth. Well, said the diplomat, starting to see the shape of the data miner's point, Warp space travel has always been an inexact science at times and was even less accurate decades ago. It's possible you are reading too much into a handful of coincidences. The data miner rubbed their eye stalks, feeling exhaustion creeping in for how much frantic effort they had put in over the past three-day cycle. Yes, but to borrow an idiom for the humans, once is happenstance, twice is coincidence, but three times is a pattern let alone a solid dozen instances within barely a 50-year time span. Even the most heavily trafficked routes past the most dense or erratic planetoids have only achieved a third of that number. 
You're asking me to disrupt peaceful and productive diplomatic ties with humans by suggesting they were responsible for these instances. Are you truly suggesting that this was intentional from humanity's part? I am. That may be, but we will require more proof than mere happenstance, unlikely though it may be. I have additional data as well. Gago was the most proud of this next part, and he carefully pulled up the diagrams and charting maps. A vibrant animation appeared on screen of what appeared to be a rainbow-coloured and spiked disc, surging and shaking on the screen. This is the analysis of the gravitational field irregularities within a quarter of a solar year of Earth's primary star. The diplomat looked nonplussed at the diagram. I would assume the fluctuations here are not ideal. No, indeed. They could be likened to a reef within a shallow sea, permitting transit in the calm regions, but damaging and disrupting ships passing through a rough space. I have reached out to several of the shipping guilds for more details, but initial reports back support this theory, with several commenting that the route passing near to Earth is highly undesirable amongst experienced pilots due to the rough effects it has on engine stability and wear and tear. The diplomat looked over the diagram further before attempting to wave it away dismissively. But who's to say that this isn't a natural phenomena of Earth's system? There are many regions of space that are disruptive or dangerous to travel through in warp space, so what would make Earth's patch of turbulence unique? The fact that they can turn it on and off at will. The diplomat coughed violently as the surprise dislodged the piece of fruit pulp he was eating out of his primary digestion sac, and instead into the top of his gas exchange organ. What in the three spheres do you mean they can turn it off? Gago grimaced this time as he keyed in some commands to the report. This time, the disc figure that was pulled was much grainier and blocky, fine measurements now showing as wide swaths. This was reverse calculated from a series of gravimetric scans done across that entire arm of the galaxy. Even with the poor resolution, the diplomat could still see that this was a wildly chaotic and dangerous gravitational field. It looks the same. The data miner nodded. Yes, but watch here. It's hard to tell, but this readout is actually playing in reverse, stepping backwards through time. We're about to hit 76 years ago. What's so important about 76? The diplomat cut off, words caught like fruit pulp in his throat, as the image abruptly stilled. The disc depicting the gravitational field was now still and smooth as a windless pond. So it just started one day? Indeed. Diplomat hail he. And furthermore, this beginning of the turbulence was a mere month before the first vessel lost control and was forced to make an emergency landing on Earth. The possibilities were rapidly narrowing, but Hale he was still in favour of exploring whatever possible shred he could find to avoid confronting the dawning reality about humans. Well, while things of this nature are highly irregular, I presume, I'm still not convinced that this shows they can activate it at will. I know, Gego said, which is why I wanted to show you that data before I show you this. The gravitational field display became the ragged, tumultuous ocean of currents and surges, and this time in the higher detail that told Hale, he this was more recent readings. I'm sure you saw the announcements a fortnight ago that humanity had tested their first faster-than-light engine they had made themselves, rather than trading for, and successfully made a jaunt out to the furthest planetoid in their star system and back without incident. Yes, the diplomat said cautiously. I received this data from a colleague who was concerned there may have been an instrument malfunction to produce such data as I'm about to show you. She checked and validated it herself. It was fully accurate and reliable, which makes it all the more troubling. I don't think she realized the cause of what she was seeing, but unfortunately the timing of it adds up too perfectly. The data miner continued quietly recalling, I believe at this point, we're at 30 seconds to launch the human's test flight. Hell, he let out an involuntary gasp of breath as the gravity field abruptly stilled again, perfectly smooth simultaneously across the entire spread of it. Grimly, the data miner said, Here we had the jump, and after a short pause continued, And the return. A few seconds later and the field abruptly resumed its turbulence. The diplomat was still in shock, staring at the gravimetric readout, when Gago said, That's also not the most concerning part either. 
This was supposed to be humanity's first faster-than-light capability of their own they were testing here. Isn't that right? Well, of course, replied Hale He. It was on all the new stations, a great achievement for a species that had been slow to achieve that milestone. I would remind you then that the readout here is half a light year in diameter. The diplomat scrunched his eye stalks in confused concentration, trying to understand what the other alien was implying when suddenly it hit him. Yet they were able to disrupt such a large region simultaneously and stop it equally quickly. Gago nodded. Whatever means they have at causing such a disruption is certainly faster than light and immensely wide-ranging. If it was slower and confined to a small area, I might have some theories as to how it could be accomplished, but this size, this scale and the speed, I have no idea. It is beyond anything our sciences and technology can produce or that of any other known species. The diplomat sat back, stunned. By the spheres, he glanced up at Gego. What do you propose we do with this information? The data miner waved an arm. Perhaps we can get to the bottom of this. Go to humanity with the information we have. Tell them we want the secrets of this technology and the power sources that feed it, as it far eclipses anything we can currently achieve. Tell them that we will expose these findings to the rest of the spacefaring civilizations of the galaxy if they continue to hold back. The diplomat's eyes widened, before after a long moment he said, I see. Well, I still need to get to my duties and figure out how to handle this. You are excused, and a reminder to keep the strictly confidential while I inform the appropriate other parties. Gego bowed in deference before leaving the office. After he left, Hal he leaned back in his saddle chair and groaned. The idiot had uncovered humanity, possessed the capability of affecting a wide chunk of space at a power and complexity unheard of among any other known species, and his first suggestion was to blackmail them. The diplomat rubbed his head, trying to make the sudden headache go away. A few thoughts were coming to mind, snippets that had been dismissed in the moment, but now he couldn't shake them, as he was reminded of the first species that had ever encountered humanity and the comments by their scientists. They had said that humans were curiously disinterested in their warp space drivers, despite not having faster-than-light capabilities already. Then the second species that encountered humanity had mentioned that a child of one of the diplomatic party had become separated from the group and accidentally come in contact with and ingested some earth flora, it wasn't something toxic or dangerous to humans, but the physiological makeup of that species reacted poorly with alkaloids in the flora and would have resulted in a swift and painful death if left untreated. But instead, the humans had administered a series of emetics and alkaloid-binding treatments, something they said was common in the case of an accidental poison ingestion. The diplomat remembered reading a footnote from the inhuman physician at the time that this particular blend of neutralizing agents was not something commonly found in human medical kits and in fact was uniquely suited to their own species biology. Both had been written off as flukes, interesting anecdotes at most, but now the diplomat began to see the greater shape of it as a species that cared not for faster than light travel for they doubtless already achieved it, mastered it and discarded it as uninteresting at some point before. A species who upon supposed first contact had comprehensive medical and anatomical knowledge of their guests sufficient enough to save a child in mere minutes from otherwise certain death. All this from a species that had befriended and gregariously hosted every alien ship that had come astray upon their planet and offered nothing but support and friendship to both waylaid travelers and their subsequent diplomatic summits, despite seeming to lack the ability to travel outside of their own star system a species that was confident, at a basal level, that Hale he was only just now beginning to truly understand. He opened a communications missive, addressed to all the other diplomats of similar station amongst the other species humanity had made contact with. Greetings to my fellow ambassadors. I come bearing difficult news regarding humanity. They are not what they appear to be. Yet I believe it is of the utmost importance that we continue to pretend that they are, for fear that otherwise we will learn who or what they truly are, 